thank you very much for uh, to the organizer for for doing this even though we are in a very uh, very weird times okay so um, very quickly because I, i've just realized that i have i have a lot of things i have a lot of things to i would like to say a lot of things um probably everybody of us has read some has read something about the involvement of third states like the us and uk uh in the, the conflict of uh, in the conflict of yemen and, and through the arms transfers of um, ar to, through arms uh, transfer uh, directed to saudi arabia so basically saudi arabia is using british and american and american uh, uh weaponry and also other other weapons coming from other uh, third states um uh, so, uh, looking at the scholarship that uh, we uh, uh, we have, uh, uh, we, we started to we started to see around we started to see around uh, this uh, this uh, this phenomenon, which is by which is not 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 new not new at all. I mean, it's a typical Cold War, and probably also uh, states started to transfer arms and things probably even before the modern age. Um, we have we still have we have we have this uh, we have this problem of saying what, what are we doing as third state are we involved in the conflict are we involved in what how the weapons the weapon the weapons we transfer are going to be used and so today in my today in my in the paper i present i'm i would like to i would like to um, draw on some uh, findings uh, findings from uh, uh, by a professor, an IR, an IR professor, Professor Anna Stavrianakis, who was quite in, involved in the um, in the research of this, uh, of the involvement of Britain, British involvement in uh, with regards to uh, Saudi Arabia intervention in Yemen. So first of all, a, a very general, a very general um, premise. Uh, since uh, at least the 1930s, uh, states. Of, but almost all states, uh, or at least the, the major, uh, let's say, the major arms arms producing states, have system domestic systems whereby they need to authorize the export. So every the export of armament. So every arms lead, uh, exiting the, the the country is authorized by by the government by the government in various ways. But the, we always have an authorization. Then we have. Then after the end of the Cold War, we started to have. We started to have a reform of these systems, and in this system, uh, we we started to see uh, pre-export uh, assessments uh, being provided by relevant legislation, and this pre-export assessment include uh, um, prevent the yeah the assessment of possible of possible violations of human rights. And humanitarian law, among other things. I'm just focusing on these two because they are the the the, the most legal the most legal criteria. Now, for example, now we have also some international and supra uh, supranational uh, supranational legislation that actually impose this kind of uh, this kind of pre-export assessment. So we have the Un the European Union Council Common Position 944 of 2008 and the Arms Trade Treaty, speaking about uh, speaking about this kind of uh, pre-export assessment based on human rights and humanitarian law. Uh, reading uh, Professor Stavrianakis' uh, findings, I, real I, realized that, I realized that she has a point in saying that these uh, this pre-export assessments can be actually used by state and are actually used by exporting states to actually escape responsibility. So uh, try, try to they try to avoid the involvement from anything that happens with the armaments beyond borders. Uh, so today, with you, I'm going. I'm going to to go through very quickly uh, through three scenarios that I identified. Um, I'm gonna skip some things that I would have liked to uh, to present with you. So if uh, uh, I miss something, please just uh, ask me some question, and then I will have uh, the chance to uh, expand on some aspects. Uh, the first scenario is when we have an overestimation of positive uh, aspects by the arms exporting states and an underestimation of, uh, uh, let's say, undesirable or inconvenient uh, uh, considerations. 
uh, if you read, for example, President Trump uh, uh, statement of the 24th of July uh, 2019, you will have an idea of what, what I mean. Trump tried to emphasize, for example, the security and the defense, the national security and defense, both of the US and uh, of Saudi Arabia, uh, rejecting, vetoing actually, the Congress resolution to stop uh, uh, to stop arm, arms uh, uh, being sent to um, to Saudi Arabia, I I argue that this basically this basically is not uh, is not uh, an interpretation that we can accept as lawyers because uh, uh, we we can look at uh, Article Seven of the Arms Trade Treaty. Even though I know that I even thank you. Even though I know that uh, I mean the U.S. is not part of the Arms Trade Treaty. But it's clear in special in special regulations, in special uh, lex specialis regulations, that uh, security and defense consideration cannot overcome uh, the risk of uh, human rights and uh, uh, IHL violations. Uh, and I argue that this is common also in other in other uh, legal regimes that uh, consider this uh, consider our, our uh, military operations or. or uh, um, risk of uh, human rights or violation of human dignity. I just mentioned, for example, the principle of non refoulement in torture. For example, uh, security and defense is no is no trump card for poss possible risk. But also, if we look at Article 14 of the Liber Code, uh, which is considered to be one probably one of the first sources of IHL, as Niels Meltzer, Meltzer points out. Military necessity is not uh, is not uh, uh, does not derogate IHL principles. So uh, soldiers need to abide by IHL even when they are actually uh, they are actually um, uh, uh, claiming that they are doing something in, in, for military for military needs. Um, so this is the first scenario, and uh, so it's a, a it's a way for for saying that uh, well we need to to frame risk assessment properly according to the principles of inter that we have already in international law. The second scenario is when uh, we have uh, uh, the, the argument or actually the po even actually the possibility by the treaty itself, for example, the Arms Trade Treaty, uh, we have states saying we are putting in place mitigating risk mitigating measures to decrease the, re the level of risk in order to send arms uh, abroad uh, anyway. My idea, um, my idea on which I'm, ba I'm, I'm basing the originality of my, my future uh, doctoral dissertation, um, is, uh, is the idea that uh, these mitigating measures, even though they don't speak about prevention, these are, uh, these are actually evidence of uh, an obligation to prevent. Exactly like exactly like uh, the triad the, the triad of uh, the Alabama Corfu and genocide case are explaining us. Of course, we don't have a provision like the genocide case, where which exactly spells out prevent the duty to prevent. But if we look at the purpose of the Arms Trade Treaty, and and we look also at the relevant relevant case, international case law, we can we can see that the exporting state. Is put in a position of preventing some undesirable and unlawful effects of the arms trade, and mitigating mitigating risk mitigating measure, measures needs to be interpreted in that way. Finally, unfortunately, probably it's the most contested point of my paper, and I left it uh, I left it at the end. I would like to argue as well that uh, there is a link between uh, due diligence obligations. Uh, due diligence obligation in the case of arms transfer regulation and complicity. I would like to argue, as uh, uh, as other people have already have already done in other fields, uh, that uh, due di the respect abiding by due diligence obligations actually put the arms exporting state in a position for having a higher degree of knowledge with regards to the final destination and the final use of the arm of the arms um, so these are my arguments i just wrap up 
um, I'm really fascinated by uh, by what some authors say say that uh, uh, thinking about risk means uh, thinking or imagining future. I would say that as international lawyers, we when we imagine the future, we should uh, think about a future that has no torture, human rights violations, or IHL violations uh, in that future. Okay, so we need actually to read the uh, risk assessment rules in that way in uh, in a way that uh, um, risk assessments are not be are not used as a, a jail free card for arms exporting state and even arms exporting state have their own uh, responsibility for uh, the final use of the arms thank you very much <laughs>